Welcome to You and Your Pets. I am Jim Horton. We're here with our resident expert, Dr. Ernest Rogers, and with a special guest tonight. And Dr. Rogers, would you kindly introduce our guest? Today, I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Naomi Bernier, who is not only Canadian, but from my hometown, uh, which is sort of unusual in, in the sense that we're still working in New Jersey. Um, Dr. Bernier studied at uh, University of Montreal and did some residency work down here, and I'll let you continue with that line. Okay, so you studied at the University of Montreal, and then you, where did you do your residency? I did my uh, residency at the University of Pennsylvania mm -hmm. uh, in Philadelphia. Um, it was a two-year residency, and prior to that, I did my internship um, in small animal and surgery at Purdue University in Indiana. Take us into neurology a little bit, if you would, please. I, I, I know a little bit about neurology in humans, but I really know absolutely nothing about neurology in animals. What is it we're dealing with? Uh, actually, it's pretty much the same type of conditions that you deal with with people. Um, probably the most two common presentation that I see are seizures, seizure disorder, and uh, paralysis from disc herniation, which afflicts people too. Um, there is some difference on the presentation and the type of disease, but mostly it's the same type of condition that we see um, in human medicine. Um, we, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see also problems with uh, nerve and muscle, like the Guillain-Barre syndrome that we see sometimes in people um, secondary to viral infection or um, vaccination. We see the same thing in animals. Um, we see it. Um, tumors in the tumors brain. Tumors in the brain, actually, brain tumors. We also right. see uh, in um, in dogs and cats. They have their own specific tumors that they tend to be predisposed. Uh, for example, cats tend to have benign brain tumors that we call uh, meningiomas, which people get to, um, and then dogs get more of a different variety of tumors. Um, often a little bit more malignant and, and harder to um, cure. Uh, often it's just a remission, but um, we see pretty much the same type of condition. Basically, uh, if I can just add in right. here, neurology is the study of the brain, mm -hmm. the spinal cord, and all the little wires that go out to the different parts of the body, so anything can be seen. You can see something we call radial paralysis, mm -hmm. which the, the paw actually flexes backward and the animal can't straighten it. So there are a number of things that Dr. Bernier is being modest, but there are a number of things that she treats that are very common in humans and animals, trauma and that type of thing that will make a difference to the animal's life and their longevity. And uh, though neurology used to be thought of uh, a, a science where you diagnose and then you euthanize, now, with the added addition of MRIs and CT scans and many other modalities, Dr. Bernier can make a healthy life out of a not-so-positive outcome. Now, you're with Garden State Veterinary Services, yes. that's correct. Yes. Okay. Now, uh, in urology in humans takes a fairly long residency, does it not? Uh, is it the same thing when, that we're dealing with with animals that, that you have to do a, a quite a bit more study uh, beyond uh, even a, a, a normal residency? Um, it's similar to the other residencies in veterinary medicine. It's about the same amount of time. Oh, it is. Um, in terms of uh, in, in human medicine, there's a lot of subspecialties. I mean, there's people that would study only seizures, uh, or I will do certain types of neurology only in children. Mm -hmm. So there's subspecialties and that they need to go on for a lot more studies than um, in veterinary medicine. But pretty much it's similar time as a uh, veterinary surgeon uh, or a veterinary cardiologist. It's usually uh, one year of internship or similar training, sometimes two years of clinical practice would be the equivalent to the three years. Um, and then a residency training, which is usually about three years. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, the, the neurology discipline is actually uh, uh, monitored and tested by the American College of Veterinary Internal Medicine. Um, but recently they developed also a uh, training with neurosurgery, uh, separate training where we can perfect our technique and, and get a certification for that too. But it, it's as risky to do neurosurgery surgery on animals as it is on humans, is Absolutely. it not? Absolutely, yes. Yeah, so yes. you really have to be very, very careful, particularly if you're anywhere around the brain. 
brain and spinal cord. You know, it can be very tedious surgery and certainly have to be very careful not to cause further damage and obviously have a favorable outcome. So it's Fortunately, dogs don't drive or read books yes. or <laughs> compose music, so we don't know if we've developed a problem. Uh, we don't have a Mozart dog that all of a sudden can't hear uh, music uh, or tones. So we do have a little bit of leeway, but yeah. there's no question that neurology, and that's one of the subjects that I f felt I may have wanted to pursue as a young veterinarian, neurology is one of the more difficult, more challenging, and certainly one of the more fulfilling areas of veterinary medicine. Okay. Now, you do surgery. Absolutely, yes. And uh, how, how often are you seeing animals? Are you seeing several different uh, patients a day? Yes. Um, in terms of do surgery, I do surgery every day. You do? Often with neurology, it's an urgent matter. You often have to operate fairly quickly. Um, f probably the most common cause of... Um, the most common surgery I perform is emulaminectomies for acute disc extrusion, which we see in the small breeds. Um, we call them chondrodystrophic breeds. They tend to have early degeneration of their cartilage, and it makes them prone to sudden rupture of their disc, and you know the disc material that's inside mm -hmm. will go into the spinal canal and apply pressure on the spinal cord and, and can cause immediate paralysis. So usually we have to act promptly when we deal with sun paralysis. Um, they have to be taken care of in the first 24 um, hours, maybe you know, 24, 48 hours to have the best outcome. So we, we tend to uh, take care of those cases immediately. Um, so I pretty much will do surgery uh, on a daily basis. And that's actually a common problem we probably see you know, depending on the week, probably three to eight, just, I mean, we're actually two neurologists I might practice by myself, three to eight per week, and my colleague probably the same amount. So it's, it's a very common problem um, and something that we, um, we have to deal with. Um, and you work principally by referral, that's correct? I mean, uh, veterinarians refer from all over northern New Jersey to, to your office. Exactly. Well, New Jersey, pretty much the whole state of New Jersey, some areas of New York, uh, sure. Staten Island, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, too. Just to interject, chondrodystrophic breeds, in that you can put dachshunds as one of the major breeds that we see problems with discs. And some of the signs of, of disc problems, as with humans, although it seems to be more acute with animals, so all of a sudden their back legs will stop working. And so the chondrodystrophic breeds or the dachshunds and the other longer back, the, the basset hounds, some of the other longer back breeds tend to have these acute onset of paralysis, which if I see, I treat symptomatically and then refer to Dr. Bernier, who then does a, a definitive diagnosis, identifies the disc either on an MRI or by localization of symptoms, goes in, opens up the back, and takes the disc out or parts of the disc out to relieve the pressure on the nerves. So that was just a translation of what Dr. <laughs> Bernier did. Well, I mean, so I'm a householder, and I wake up one morning, and there's my little uh, doggy all of a sudden with his hind legs just flat on the floor. And when that happens, I just don't have many hours to get that dog in, right? Is that correct? Right. I mean, you, you know, um, probably have the day, but, you know, you have to get started quickly. The sooner it gets evaluated, the better. Uh -huh. um, and, you know, most veterinarians know that if you go to your local veterinarian down the street, they'll recognize right away that they're dealing with a serious problem that needs immediate attention and often will refer immediately. Right. Um, so usually that is done within a day or so. Okay. So and knowing Max, your dog, <laughs> he's just being lazy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, can't even get, he, he can't even get up on his front legs, <laughs> much less his back legs. <laughs> So what, what, uh, obviously, since you're doing very delicate work, what kinds of, of surgical tools and all are you, you I'm, I'm assuming you must magnify almost everything you're working on, is that correct? Yeah, I mean, um, uh, microscopes or loops are often used in neurosurgery. Um, we also use uh, special types of cautery, we we'll call bipolar cautery, which is more fine and less damaging to the nervous tissue. 
Um, we use very small instruments to be able to um, access the spinal canal, and a lot of those instruments actually are coming from dental surgery in people. Is that right? So we use dental instrument, um, and they're small enough, and that allows us to um, access the spinal canal. Of course, they're sterile, and you know, um, it's we you know make sure that they are um, you know sterile and, and uh, fine to use in around the spinal cord, but. Um, a lot of the instruments that are used in, in human neurosurgery are larger and could be, um, our patients are, can be very small, the cats right. are very right. small, some of those small breeds, you know, sometimes they're two or three pounds, and we really need uh, very small instruments. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Bernier, again, is being modest <laughs> because it's all about the skill, it's all about the dexterity and using your hands and getting around things and pulling things out. It's a very, very um, challenging surgery that not everyone can do. So again, she's being modest, but she's uh, I'm very in awe of neurologists and neurosurgeons. Now, I'm assuming that uh, there are, isn't a, uh, a huge call for neurologists. I mean, how many would be in, in uh, say, northern New Jersey? You have a colleague that you work with, but yes, are there um, many others in, in northern New Jersey? In the state of New Jersey, we're a total of four. Four neurologists, four neurologists for the whole state? Yes. Oh my, yeah, that is a, that is a specialty. <laughs> yeah. um, okay, um, just before we go to the break, I'd like to get in at least one or two more quick questions on it. The, when, where did the study of neurology with animals, how long has it been going on that you've been, doing, been able to do surgery? I think when you said originally that it was a diagnose and then you basically put them down, right? Before well, what? that was Yeah, probably back. in the 70s. Yeah. In the 70s, 70s it started? It started, um, but since I would say probably the early 2000, uh, late 1990s with the advancement of MRI, We've been recognizing conditions such as, um, for example, Chiari-like malformation, which we weren't able to recognize in veterinary patients um, when we use myelogram, which is a study where we take x-rays and inject dye around the, the spinal cord to be able to determine if there's growth or uh, pressure on the spinal cord. Well, we weren't able to determine uh, if we were dealing with malformation in the back part of, of the brain and the cervical spinal cord with this technique, and we're able, you know, around that time where we start being able to do MRIs on animals and recognize this condition and then develop surgical technique to fix that particular problem. Okay, so, so it's so technology it's, driven. Yeah. It's okay. There's been a lot of development over the last 10 to 15 years in neurology. Um, that mainly came from um, the advancement of MRI. Okay, well we have to take a break. Uh, we'll take a break right now. This is You and Your Pets. I'm Jim Horton and we will be right back. Television is a powerful and influential medium that allows different groups the opportunity to produce programming that directly affects their own communities. Public, educational, and government access channels ensure that all people, regardless of race, age, gender, disability, religion, or economic status, have access to local government information and the use of a public communication forum. Make sure everyone has a voice. Support your local pet channels. Welcome back to You and Your Pets. I'm Jim Horton, and we're here with Dr. Ernest Rogers and our special guest. And I'm going to turn it over in this part to you, Dr. Rogers, so you can go through some of the animal neurology diseases that you and, and Dr. Bernier have handled. Well, Dr. Bernier handles them. I merely refer them. I think that's the, <laughs> that's the bottom line. I think uh, the one thing I want to make clear is that uh, in dealing with the brain and the spinal cord and the nerves, you actually have to be a full-fledged veterinarian, number one, but you also have to understand internal medicine and surgery. It's not like in human medicine where if you're a neurologist and someone has a cold, you send them someplace else. It's all part one and part of the parcel that neurologists have to deal with. And so their veterinary education, as, long as, as well as their neurology education, serves as one big package. So. Mm -hmm. We're going to look at a couple of cases now that are sort of interesting, and uh, these are uh, examples of uh, diseases that also occur in humans. 
Uh, and I think the first one we have here is, uh, it's on the screen, this little puppy, Dr. Bernie, would you like to tell us about this, this signalman? Yes, um, this is Benny. Um, he's a two-month-old puppy. He's actually coming from a rescue. Um, and they um, had a history that he sustained some trauma and had neurological signs, so they brought him to our hospital. Um, and clearly, um, just looking at the dog, um, he doesn't have like the normal appearance. Um, this is a, would be a little uh, Las Opso, um, but his head is, you know, kind of dome shaped um, and his eyes are more laterally deviated than they would normally. And it's hard to tell with the fur. I actually have another picture of a chihuahua with similar condition just to kind of um, elucidate, yeah, elucidate a little bit more like that dome shaped appearance of the skull and the, the deviation of, of the eyes to the side. Now his behavior was muted and he was depressed. He was slept. extremely depressed. Um, he didn't like to be restrained. He didn't like to be pet. He was blind. Uh, he was compulsively circling. He actually had a really hard time walking on slippery surfaces. He would splay, uh, get very frustrated, uh, whimpered, vocalized, really had a uh, extremely diminished quality of life. And what about seizures? Did he have any seizures? No seizures, but that's a problem that we can certainly see with this condition. Right. Okay, now let's explain one more time this condition. This is where he has fluid on the... Well, the diagnosis is hydrocephaly. Right. which is also common in humans. It's seen in humans with a dome-shaped head and similar symptoms to what Dr. Right. Bernier uh, described. And maybe Dr. Bernier can give us some of the etiology or the causes of, these, of this particular problem. Yeah, that, that occurs through their development in the womb. Um, we're not exactly sure if it's an overproduction of spinal fluid, or if there's problem with res resorption, or if there's been obstruction of the spinal fluid flow inside the brain. But what happens is the fluid builds up inside the brain, and the the ventricle, which is our which are cavities inside the brain, um, enlarge and start applying pressure on the brain tissue. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, with pressure, without pressure, um, you know, the the brain can get very thin, um, and um, they can have all sorts of neurological symptoms, mainly behavior problems. And this actually kills the brain tissue, does it not, after yes. a while? Yeah, after a while being compressed by the fluid, the brain tissue will actually disappear. And so then the, then the condition of the animal is permanent at that point? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, usually the life, the quality of life is so poor, the animal unfortunately will be euthanized, uh, usually right. due to the owner's concerns about the quality of life. Quality of life. Okay. Now, Dr. Bernier, have I messed up? This looks um, like Bubby. Yes. And so let me go back if I can and see if I can. So that's the, 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 actually the little chihuahua I was talking about. But okay. this is the MRI of Benny, the little white. Uh, white puppy, the little Lhasa Apso. And normally, um, uh, what we would see is, you know, that dark st structure in the middle. I'm going to put my finger in here. Right, this, that's it. The, right there. That is, is Looks that like a bullseye. Right. Yes. This is uh, actually all fluid. That's all fluid, fluid in that spot. The brain. So Normally, it should right be around there. The, side of the, you know, the size of the seat of an apple. And now uh -huh. it's obviously much larger. And towards the back part of the brain, Which is right, right here, here right. this should be all filled up with this gray tissue, this is a cerebellum, mm -hmm. and that's all filled up with fluid also. Um, Just for orientation, this front part of the brain where the big uh, hole is, is actually thought to be related to thinking and feeling and emotions. Well, the back part of the brain, the cerebellum, and you can always remember it because the man pulling a bell, mm -hmm. that's coordination. And so we see animals like this. This explains some of the symptoms Dr. Bernier has described, that coordination is lacking, that uh, behavior is lacking, and there's a depression because those two parts of the brains have been compromised. When it's this big, does that mean there's already been permanent damage to the brain? Um, there's been some damage, um, but um, some of the signs still can be reversed when you get them very young, that like this puppy was two, three months okay. of age. Um, and it's best to treat them early on like this to give them a chance to um, reverse their symptoms. But there's been some damage. It's always hard to know what's permanent, what's not. Sometimes what we can do before performing surgery is give them medication to reduce the production of spinal fluid 
reduce the swelling and see what type of behavior and uh, quality of life they have with medical management. If we see a dramatic improvement, that you know shows us that there's likelihood that we'll really improve the patient with surgery. If we don't see improvement, it doesn't mean that we can't help the dog with surgery, but it makes the prognosis a little bit more guarded. And this dog was extremely symptomatic. I mean, he had, had absolutely no quality of life mm -hmm. if, if he was left like this. And with medical management, actually, improved very little. Um, it was a very severe case. Um, now, just to orient people, these are MRIs, mm -hmm. and they're basically plate cuts through the brain at different levels that allow you to see that tissue at that level. So the last one we took was what we call a sagittal section or from the nose back to the back of the head. Mm -hmm. This one is across the head. Mm -hmm. So it would be uh, from eye to eye, so to speak, as a plate would fall right. if you put a plate in one ear. So this is the same dog, I believe? The same dog. Um, this is a cut through uh, where you see the large black structures. These are the ventricle. This is all fluid. Mm -hmm. And normally that should be mainly brain tissue with only two little seat-like structure that would be filled up with fluid. Now, what, what is the surgery exactly for this? Is this the same as for humans where you put in a shunt or a tube that yes. drains? Yes, It's absolutely. exactly the same thing. It's the thing. same. Actually, we the device that we purchased to fix this dog is a human device for, uh, it was a very small patient, two to three pounds. So we use a uh, neonatal, uh, the, the smallest um, tube they, they had available in veterinary medicine. Uh, in human medicine, so it's um, it's a device where we'll put a, a catheter, so we'll put the tubing inside the ventricle, inside the brain, right? And that fluid is there's a valve that allows to pull that fluid out from the brain, but not come back in, and then come back in, right. and then travel into. Um, we can either drain this fluid into the belly, uh -huh. which is the easiest um, and less complicated uh, way of doing it, or we can also put it around. Um, the, the heart itself, you know, have the fluid accumulate that there. But usually, we, we, most of the time, we use uh, an abdominal approach. So the, the tube will travel from the brain tissue. Usually, the valve is around the neck area, and then we tunnel um, the tube into the abdominal cavity, and that's where the fluid drains. Okay. This is another case of hydrocephalus, though it's much more clear that this animal has a dome-shaped head. Those of us who've had Chihuahuas might think this is pretty normal, but because um, they do have dome-shaped heads, but this is even larger than what we'd expect. The eyes are deviated laterally. In other words, the dog, the dog seems to be looking outwards all the time, and they seem to be a little propped toast or a little pushed out. And how old was this puppy? This puppy was about four months. Four months old? Four months old. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. Now, after uh, three to four months, what is the actual recovery ratio that you would have out of an animal like this? Uh, particularly, like, so let's take, it was Benny, right? It was the first the, one. The first, first, one. first dog. Did, did he recover most of his function, or does well, he have been, some resident ticks that you're never going to be able to recover? Yeah, since the surgery, and it's been only about two weeks, so it's a recent surgery for Benny. Um, he is doing much better, but he's not a normal dog um, as of yet. Um, and usually you'll see improvement within that, those first, um, you know, three days to two weeks once, you know, mm -hmm. the, but the head is, uh, w which is kind of amazing, doesn't seem to be as large and the owners notice, notice that too. Um, he lets the owner pet him, he's not as angry anymore, uh -huh. he's eating by himself, he's uh -huh. able to walk without falling, um, he's not circling compulsively like he used to, so he's markedly better, but he's not you know, he's still a special needs dog. He still has some deficit uh, blindness and um, some behavior change. I'm not sure if he's gonna be able to be fully house trained, um, but the owners are very dedicated and definitely right now he has a quality of life. As of before doing this procedure, he was, you know, had absolutely no quality of life. We are running out of time, so can we run through very quickly some of the other th uh, cases that we're talking well, that we, we can, wanted to show here? We can certainly try. And Let maybe me. we can just mention them so uh, our well, viewers can have an idea. There's something called myasthenia gravis, and we do have a video, but we have. I don't think we're going to have enough time to show it. Myasthenia gravis is a, uh, a disease that affects the nerve going to the muscle, 
and the animals are very, very weak. And Dr. Bernier can give us a short synopsis of that. Yeah, they, what happens is an autoimmune disease. So the body starts attacking its own uh, uh, neuromuscular junction. Um, and they become extremely weak. And one of the testing that we do is we inject a medication that will um, kind of overload the neuromuscular junction with the, with the neurotransmitter, and all of a sudden they become, um, have strength again. So this is actually a video of the cat. It's extremely weak. He can't even support his head. This is typical uh, posture that we see in a cat with this disease. We call it ventral flexion of the neck, so the, the head is completely down and the cat is not even strong enough to prop himself up. And after we give the injection of this medication, um, all of a sudden he's able to stand, he's able to walk. He's still slightly weak. He's not 100% normal, but there's dramatic improvement right there. Um, and we see this condition in dogs, we see this condition in cats. Um, and in the, humans? In humans too. Um, and the Abyssinian, this is an Abyssinian, um, uh, is predisposed to this condition. Uh, we can see it uh, also secondary to certain types of cancer, um, particularly thymomas, which is a tumor of... Um, the thyroid? Uh, it, of, of, um, uh, it's basically a tissue that uh, usually disappears when you mm -hmm. become adult. Um, and then uh, we can see it sometimes with liver cancer. Okay, well I'm afraid we've run out of time and this has been absolutely fascinating. I would hope we could get you back and talk about this some more. This is You and Your Pets. I'm Jim Horton. We've been here with our special guest, Dr. Bernier, and with our resident expert, Dr. Rogers. And thank you very much for watching.